pray. Ephesians chapter 6, as Paul winds up the letter here, he gives a rally cry, I guess you would, would call it, and really gives the encouragement, the admonition to diligently serve God as a soldier of Christ, using that imagery, of course, of a Roman soldier. And why might he use that imagery, or what, what's his cir current circumstance that might really bring that to the forefront of his mind to use for this illustration? Do what? Prison. Yeah, he's in prison. In he's. Do, go ahead. In Rome. In Rome. Right. So he would probably have the visual of lots of Roman soldiers on the Right, exactly. Yeah, his guards, the, the people who are guarding him, we know at the end of Acts 28 uh, that he, he was in a rented house, but he had a guard with him watching him, essentially under house arrest, but with the Romans having control of his activities and his freedoms and things like that. So he would have been very familiar because, remember, if you back up, it had been a few years that he had been a prisoner of Rome and he had guards with him all the time throughout that time, besides just living in that environment, in that world, but uh, he would have had one probably within a few feet of him as he is writing this letter. So um, just thinking about that, he's, he's got this in his mind, he uses that, and really the Holy Spirit uses that to make a spiritual application, as very often in the New Testament, you see where there are things that are common in the society or in the environment in which the people live that then are used to make a spiritual point or given a significance or a special meaning uh, in the New Testament. So, be that as it may, let's read Ephesians 6 verses 10 down through 18 for the moment. 10 through 18, who will grab that for us? Go ahead, Clint. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against cosmic powers over the present darkness, against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, having on, put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. Okay. So, he says we're to be strong in the Lord, put on the armor of God. Put on the whole armor of God. Uh, why would he use this? Why would he bring up this idea of putting on armor? Okay, it's going to be a battle. What's what's another way, or what what might we add to that? A battle is part of what? It's part of a war, right? There are individual battles we go through that are part of an overall conflict that is war, and we are at war. Uh, remember Second Timothy. 2 Timothy, if you'll just jump over there and take a note of this. Because this is a recurring theme in the New Testament about this conflict, this battle, this war that we're in. 2 Timothy chapter 2, let's notice um, verse 1 and then verse 3 as Paul addresses Timothy specifically about this same type of thing. So 2 Timothy 2 verse 1 and then verse 3. Who'll grab that? Go ahead, Rick. You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. In verse 3, you therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. 
Okay. So be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. That same idea of us being strong in the Lord in Ephesians chapter 6. And then endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. The Sometimes this idea of militancy or military or fighting is not palatable to some Christians. They don't like the idea of we're in a fight for something. They don't like that idea of being militant about the truth. But the New Testament repeatedly brings up that idea that this is a war in which we find ourselves. Um, when you think about war, you think about it generally, what, what are things that come to mind when you think about war? Preparation. preparation. You have to make preparation for that. And that's part of what he's discussing here that ties into it. Anything else? Training. Training. Anything else? Familiarity with weapons. Okay. You have to be familiar with weapons. Thus the training, preparation, getting ready to go out. What about the actual war itself? Hardship. Hardship, right? War is hard. If you've ever been in the military, it, of course, Hank could speak to this probably pretty well, and the hardship that comes along with it. It's a hard thing. Paul, you have something? Well, there's some suffering there. You know, uh, uh, you have to be brave, you know, to face your enemy, and then sometimes it's a lot of suffering. And, uh, after the hardship, there's, there's, you got to deal with your emotions, you got to deal with your attitude, and that comes with training, building up. You have to be prepared for that, and that's what these verses. We have to be prepared for the hardships ahead of us. Yes, there, there's hardship. There's suffering associated with it. When you think about you know, physical conflict, you think about it being bloody, it's dirty, especially you think about the types of war and the types of battles that they had back in the first century. You're talking about men out in a field and they're there in the elements, the, the heat, the cold or whatever. They, they didn't have the type of things that we might have today. They didn't, certainly didn't stand off, you know, today several miles and, you know, face the enemy that way. They, they were on the field with the enemy, and we'll talk more about that in a little bit. It's dangerous. It's frightening. It, there's fear involved as you get out there in that actual conflict that's going on. Chris? Surrounding yourself with uh, the Word of God is putting on the whole world. God. You go out and you face the world that we live in as the world of sin and the spiritual battle that's going on around us. And if we don't arm ourselves with God's Word, which guides us through and what we need to do, then we're completely unprepared. Right, right, exactly. And Paul's preparing us to go out and face this war. Uh, Rick, and then Paul, did you have something? Paul, did you have something? No, that, that, that's right. I'm going on with what Chris said, yes. Very good. Say also the sacrifice that you have a lot of um, um, warriors to, to give. Just, just on behalf of <coughs> right. have, this idea of freedom or whatever it is, democracy or sure. whatever, we try to spread our idea. And sometimes it's through war, and some are so devoted to that idea, they're willing to sacrifice their lives for it. Um, same thing here, I think that we you know, need to understand that as well. This, you know, we're willing to sacrifice our lives for it if necessary. Right, exactly. Uh, you know, there after 9-11, which many of us, it's, it's crazy, it's going to be 20 years, but it's still fresh in our memory, that there was a wave of young men that said, why did you join the military? Well, 9-11. That's what inspired me. I was in middle school, I was in high school, and there was this, you know, about a decade wave of, of young people that, like, I, I want to protect my country and our freedoms. And so this idea, and they're like, 
yeah, I'll go and give myself. And there were some famous cases of professional athletes like, we're, we're setting that aside, we're going to go. Uh, I think it's Pat Tillman was a, maybe one of the most famous that he went and died on the battlefield. Um, so yeah, when you think of war, you think of sacrifice, you think of hardship, suffering, dangerous, all those things that come together. We are at war. Those elements are at play with this war in which we are involved. Now, question number one I asked, we are admonished to be strong in the Lord. And I asked you to find some other passages that give a similar admonition and be prepared to discuss them. So other passages that give that idea of being strong in the Lord. Anybody have one they want to share? Clint? Romans 4.20 talks about Abraham. <clears throat> No distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God. So we just kind of see here through his obedience and his the faith that made him obedient made him stronger, and he was able to give glory back to God because of all that. Right, right. Anybody else? Mike. Well, the same uh, Greek word, I did a back search of just the Greek word, and it, it shows up in Philippians chapter 4, um, verse 13, where it says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Okay, exactly right. And Lord will, when we get to uh, Philippians chapter 4, we'll talk about how that verse in particular is taken way out of context. I mean, they apply it to, you know, a middle school basketball game. Totally not it. <laughs> it. It is talking about this type of thing in, in serving the Lord and sacrificing for the Lord, that strength that we need. That's, that's a good one because of those deprivations that someone would face. Any others? How about 2 Timothy 2.1? We read that just a minute ago. 1 Corinthians 16.13. 1 Corinthians 16.13. If we could get someone to read that for us, please. Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong, be strong. Okay. So the, the Corinthians, they had many, many problems, and Paul at the end of that letter admonishes them, stand fast, same concept, stand strong, stand fast in the Lord, be brave. You know, do what you need to do. Um, fortify yourself to face these difficulties and hardships as a child of God. Any other thoughts there? You go back to Ephesians chapter 6, and he says, Finally, my brethren, be strong how? In verse 10. Where? Maybe I should say. Hey, in the Lord. Right? That's where our strength is going to be is in the Lord in a relationship with Him. Put on the armor. Go ahead. Especially in the power of His might. Yes. That is, that is where you're relying upon is not just like so many people want to say, I, I let the Lord guide me to do all things for me. Well, yes, but we're relying, our faith is in His power, His might. Uh, it brings me back to the idea of the way the Lord's prayer is finished. It with may yours be all power of the Lord in heaven. So he is all powerful. We have no we should have no doubt about that, that he can do anything he decides to do. Right, exactly right. In in the power of his might. Not the power of my might, but of His might. That's a very good point there. So we, we are to put on this armor of God. Um, and it says, put on. That, that's an active command on our part. We are to put it on. The Lord's not going to put that armor on us. We have to put it on ourselves. Now, He provides it. He made it. He makes it available to us, but we're the ones that actually have to put the armor on. Um, and the armor is effective. 
It's effective for exactly the intent that he designed it, if you will. So if we will put that armor on, it will be useful to us. It will be helpful to us. Paul. Second Corinthians uh, chapter 6. Let's see. Verse 7. By the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. Exactly. Another admonition. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right, question number two I ask, why do we need to put on the armor of God? What does he say here? Stand against the powers of darkness. Stand against the powers of darkness. If we're going to survive this war, we have to have the armor of God on. He specifically mentions the wiles of the devil. What are the wiles of the devil? Where where else is that described or talked about or mentioned? And well, it's all the deception that goes on around us. And you know, whenever I whenever I read this, it says so that you'll be able to stand firm. You know, I kind of think of someone who's rooted, who's grounded in something, someone who's not going to be easily moved, um, because all these schemes are going to be going on around us and all these little tricks and everything else, but there's something that you have to be able to be rooted in, if not. You're just like a, a, you can't be like a wave tossed to and fro. You have to be grounded in something. Right, exactly right. Uh, Clint and then Chris. I was just going to read what Mike quoted. Uh, it's Ephesians 4, 14. So that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. And uh, we already noted that we're in a battle, but here it's plural, it's schemes, it's plans, it's, it's constant, it's continual. And so we have to be prepared and ready for the flaming darts, for the cunning craftiness of deceit, for the father of lies, Keep going. Hey, father of lies, exactly. Chris. And it also gives you the appearance that you need to have in this world. The word go out, let our light shine, letting this world know who we are and what we stand for. And by putting on the armor of God we stand for, people, when you stand out like a sword of ministry, they know, well, that, that's a man of God. This is a Christian family. And that helps you in that aspect. Right. Yes, exactly right. We will stand out as we put on the armor of God because so few people actually put it on. Mike and then Paul. I was going to say that it doesn't say so that you may be able to outmaneuver Satan. It's so that you're standing still, grounded on something. He's doing all the maneuvering and all that kind of stuff around you. You have to be able to identify those things so that you remain where you, where you currently are. Don't give any ground on that. Right, standing in that truth and that relationship with God, don't let Him move you off of that, trick you away from it, or intimidate you. Standing in the Word of Truth is being true and being honest. And somebody spreading a lie or telling something or read scripture that's not even that there, you know. You need to know what's in there. You need to know what the truth is. Yes. You can't believe a lie. That's, that's the devil. Exactly. Now, question number three, pulled from verse 12, what type of struggle are we in? How does he describe it there? It's a word that he uses in particular in the New King James. Maybe there's different... Do not wrestle with flesh and blood. Okay. Wrestle. Yeah. I. Wrestle or some say wrestle. <laughs> what is that? It's a, it's a, it's a conflict. Okay, it's, it's, not, it's not what's on our modern TVs, I'll just tell you that. What, so what is it, actually? Spiritual. Well, it's spiritual, but when you think of wrestling <coughs> in the sense that he's using it, I kind of view this as what Jacob did with the angel. Mm -hmm. Okay. This was a struggle of position. Okay. 
Okay? It's hand-to-hand, -hand, face to face combat is what he's talking about. This is not, as we were saying a while ago, it's, it's not like you're in an artillery battery five miles away from the enemy and, and lobbing things on them. It's you face to face grappling with the enemy. And he says, we don't wrestle with flesh and blood and the implication then, but against. So we do wrestle against principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, against the spiritual host of wickedness in the heavenly place. That's where we have the conflict, but he says, this is wrestling. And when you think of this ancient wrestling, the one who was defeated, the loser, was executed. That's the point. You, you're in a fight to the death here. This is not just like you're going to win a trophy and walk off or you don't win a trophy and you get a participation ribbon or something. You either win and live or you lose and you die. That's the type of conflict we're in, Mike. Yeah, and Paul talks about this also in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And I don't know if you were going to go to this. We are going to okay. jump there. Yeah, no, that's, that's exactly right. So it's not against flesh and blood, right? He's saying, all he's saying there is it's not a physical fight. We're, we're not in a fight for territory. We're not in a fight for resources. We are not in a fight for political power or control. Okay, now there are a lot of religious people in our country that believe we are in a fight for political power and control. That is not our fight. Our fight is a spiritual fight. It's for the souls of men and women. That's what it is. Now, if there are consequences, if there is a benefit to that in our political climate, so be it. But that, that battle is not our battle as the children of God, as the church of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are not a political organization. There are a lot of religions around us that that is one of their primary things. They want political power and influence. Now, we're not in a physical fight. We're in a spiritual conflict, as uh, was mentioned a while ago. Well, I'll tell you what. Let's go ahead and jump to that 2 Corinthians. We're going to come back to it in a little bit. But 2 Corinthians 10, and grab those verses you wanted to grab there, Mike. Uh, 10 verse 2. I ask that when I am present, I need not be bold with confidence with which I propose to be courageous against some who regard us as if we walked according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing that raises up against the knowledge of God, and we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And we are ready to punish all disobedience whenever your obedience is complete. Okay. Again, emphasizing we, we don't have physical fights as the children of God to advance the cause of God. It is a spiritual conflict. And as it emphasizes there, we're talking about ideas, principles, morals. That's where our conflict is in, in arguing what is right and showing here's what's right, here's what's wrong. And we have that standard on which we can, we can base our arguments versus it's my opinion versus your opinion versus society's, you know, however they behave. It, it's that truth and we're in that spiritual conflict against, as Ephesians 6 says, forces of evil. We come into conflict with evil. How? How do we do this? Uh, let me ask you this. Who here has ever seen Satan? Anybody? Ever seen Satan? I haven't either. Do we have a battle with Satan? Yeah. He, he's our adversary. But how does that battle actually play out? Temptation. 
How, how does temptation come? Is, is everyday temptation from your own desires? From your own desires, but how does, how does that happen? There's the hearts involved, but how does that happen? How does it actually take place? Let me give you a for instance. You're at work, and one of your co-workers, maybe they insult you. And the temptation is to insult them back or to say something ugly back. But how did that temptation come to you? Or how did this situation even arise? There's somebody else there. Right? Almost all of our temptations deal with some other human being. So something's happening with other people. Yes, I know there are things that are in our mind that tempt us, and it could just be in our mind, in our heart, that we commit a sin. We can commit sin with words. We can commit sin with deeds. But generally, some way, there is another person involved. And I'm just trying to make the point is, the devil uses people to get to us, or situations with people to get to us. And so while the devil is the ultimate enemy, let's understand he uses things around us, people around us, to bring up these situations or, or to, to reach in, if you will, and tempt us to lose our temper or to lust or to be angry or to steal or whatever it may be. These, these situations come up around us. So we face other people in this conflict. We face people who have no idea about God, no concept of serving Him or loving Him or doing His will. They think you should just be able to live however you want to. But we also face people who believe they are serving Christ, but they're actually enemies of Christ. Philippians chapter 3, Paul talks about that. You know, they're, they're enemies of the cross of Christ. And he's talking about actually Christians in that case who are enemies of the cross of Christ. So we come into this conflict and very often we're facing other people. We're facing persecution or temptation or taunting or, or a, an idea. Maybe it's evolution and a professor is trying to teach us evolution. And we have to resist that. We are in that conflict. There, there's a, a battle going on there for our hearts and minds. And we have to be prepared for that type of thing. So we have to be ready to survive, as he calls it here, that evil day. Any other thoughts to that point? Clint? Yeah, we kind of go back to when Peter cut off the ear, uh, you know, right before his arrest. Jesus said to him, in verse 52 of Matthew 26, then Jesus said to him, put your sword back into its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father and he will once send me more than 12 angels of angels, but how shall I fulfill the scriptures? And so you kind of see here where there's a futility to physical war. It's, sometimes there's a really good purpose for it. I'm not trying to dismiss that. But there is a definite futility to man's wars. But there is never a futility to the spiritual battles we fight. Ever. Right. Exactly right. And similar to that, there's that saying, the pen is mightier than the sword. You know, to persuade someone to come around to a different point of view, a different conviction, is much more powerful than trying to force them physically to comply to something. Yeah, you know, we all know of very powerful speakers just throughout history that were able to <laughs> their mind, the mind of other men. Mm -hmm. and, you know, as you said, that is the persuasiveness of it. And, you know, even Paul talks about this, and he said, knowing that all these things are going to come about, we persuade men. You know, we don't force them. <laughs> exactly. It's, it's the reasoning from the Scripture, from the truth, from the power of God unto salvation, the reasoning of that, the explaining, the pleading with men to accept that truth. That's what we are doing as we go out and face this battle and as we are attacked ourselves. So 
he tells us that we have this battle, um, verse 13, take up the whole armor of God so that we'll be able to stand. And then he begins to list out this armor in verses 14, really down through 17. In question four, I asked you to pick out two pieces of armor and explain how each helps us. So just jump in as we go through this list if you want to make a comment on a particular piece of armor. But first of all, waist girded with truth. Think about a Roman soldier. How was a Roman soldier, what was his waist girded with and why? Does anybody know? Anybody remember? His waist, he had a thick leather strap around it. Now today, um, in warehouses, and sometimes you can go into different big box stores and you see the workers, they've got these big things around their waist. Why do they have that? <laughs> to give strength, right, to the core there. To help give strength, to help protect the back. They, they wear those things. And the Roman soldier, in part, his waist was girded with a leather belt to help in that, but also to put other pieces of armor or implements on that he could use, you know, tuck things in there, stuff like that. But it's really more for giving strength under stress. Um, what about a breastplate of righteousness? <clears throat> what does that do for us? What does a breastplate do? Protects what? Okay, your heart and? Yeah, the lungs. Pretty well, the, there's, a, there's a reason we have a rib cage. <laughs> and, and it is... It's there to protect the heart, the lungs in particular. You know, you have some organs that are important that are below that, but the heart and lungs are vital. <laughs> if your heart gets pierced, your lungs get pierced, you don't have a whole lot of time left, right? So it's that breastplate that protects those vital organs around you um, so what about the breastplate of righteousness? Well, just to back up for a second. Sure. Truth, I mean, we talk about in James chapter 1, verse 18, in the exercise of his will, he brought us forth by the word of truth so that we would be a kind of first fruit among his creatures. And then when you get to uh, righteousness, in Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 13, it says, For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness. And in each one of these pieces, we see the word is related to somehow, some way. And um, you know, so, uh, again, with, when we're talking about righteousness, there's a word of righteousness. There's a word of truth. There's a word of salvation. All of these things, they come straight from God himself. Yes, exactly. Everything is rooted here in the truth, in the gospel. So you have that waist girded with truth that gives you strength. That truth gives you strength. Breastplate of righteousness. When you live righteously, you have a measure of protection. Right? Just one very simple thing is it keeps you out of a lot of trouble. If you live righteously then you make decisions to stay away from that trouble that comes with the sin, right? But also when you are accused of something and you live righteously, what is the outcome normally? If men are being honest, respectful, fair, I know sometimes because you're righteous they attack. That's not what we're talking about. But if you're accused of wrong and you're a righteous person, what's generally the outcome of that? Well, a lot of men will say, that doesn't sound right. So, something's wrong there. there there's right. untruth in there somewhere. They know your character. They're like, no, Mike would never do that. Somebody's pilfering mail at the post office. Well, M Mike, he's in charge. It's his fault. No, Mike, Mike is not that way. That's not true. So they don't accept it. So that helps to protect us. A breastplate of righteousness. Uh, sandals. What about the sandals? What are they there for? Protect your feet. Okay. Your 
walking in the way of righteousness, walking in the way of truth, walking and following after the path of Jesus. Lots of different ways that you can come up with the ideas, but they, they protect your feet while you're doing They do. Any other thoughts there? Roman soldiers, um, they would wear sandals with spikes in the bottom, especially for wintry climates. If they went out and it was a little slippery or whatnot, wet, things like that, they would have some spikes on their sandals that would give them sure footing, especially when they're facing others who either have sandals that don't have them or they're barefooted. They have a decided advantage when we're talking about wrestling, hand-to-hand -hand combat, their feet are firmly planted, and that's the idea here. Our feet are firmly planted in the gospel. That gospel of peace. How are we going to stand strong? How are we going to uh, move forward and be kept from being pushed back? Well, we have our feet planted, sure footing in the gospel. Any other thoughts on that? Mike? In Colossians chapter 1 and verse 5, it says, Because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of which you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel, which has come to you just as in all the world also it is constantly bearing fruit and increasing even as it has been doing in you also since the day you heard of it and understood the grace of God and truth. So again, we see this idea of the gospel being rooted in the word of God. Right, exactly. Clint. Verse 18, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that make haste to run to evil. You know, this is one of the, some of the things that the Lord hates. This is the exact opposite, right? If we have the gospel of peace put on our sandals, our shoes, we're ready for righteousness. We're ready to go to the right place. We're ready to stand fast. It's, we're not running to something that's contrary to God. Right, and part of the idea is we, we don't, um, we're able to walk in that path of truth and not be pushed off of that, and we pursue that path of truth. Uh, shield of faith, what's a shield for? Clint. One of the things that struck, struck me was when it talked about that, it said in all circumstances, take up the shield. It's it's one of those tools that you don't leave home without, that type of thing. It's, it's always on you. You never put it away. Right. It's useful in all circumstances under all attacks, that shield of faith. Something you need. How, what about a, a shield of faith for us? How would that work? How would that play out? <coughs> what does he say? Taking the shield of faith... Verse 16. Quench the fiery darts of the wicked one. Quench the fiery darts of the wicked one. So that shield of faith, in, in, a, in a battle in the first century, they would have that shield, an enemy might shoot a flaming arrow, and that it would stick in there, and then it would just burn out. It wouldn't get to them, right? So they have that shield to protect them. What, what's a flaming arrow the devil sends at us? Anything? Multiple temptations. I mean, just about anything he tries to throw at us. I mean, and he's constantly doing it. Okay. So we need to be prepared and always have that shield in place. All right, let's, in illustration, Joseph. Through Potiphar's wife, the devil kept shooting those flaming arrows. But he had that shield of faith. I can't sin against God. Not going to do it. It quenched that fiery dart. Mike? Yeah, arrows normally you send them out and then you shoot, uh, shoot the arrows to back the enemy up. And it seems like you know that's what he's trying to do here is trying to back you off of where you are. You know, just back up just a little bit. Can be very frightening, very intimidating. Yeah. Clint, do you have something? Fiery darts are categorized. Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, and pride of life. Right. I'm not trying to oversimplify it, but that's those are the things that it comes down to. Mm -hmm. They come in many forms, but those are the three main tools. Right. Exactly, Mike. And then we see again in Romans chapter 10, verse 
17, so faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And so again, grounded in that, in that Word. Exactly. Exactly right. Helmet of salvation. What's the helmet for? Mine. Protect your head. Protect your head. Think about the helmet of salvation protecting your mind, your knowledge, your understanding. As we've talked about, the devil tries to get into our head and confuse us. And he lies to us and he deceives us. That helmet of salvation, the knowledge, the hope that we have that protects our mind from being deceived, being taken away. Um, any other thoughts? Mike. In 1 Peter chapter 2, and verse 2, like newborn babies, long for the pure milk of the Word so that you may grow in respect to salvation. So again, that salvation means back to the Word. Exactly. So let's do this one too, Sword of the Spirit. So where does that link to? The sword has two different uses. It can be used for defense. But most of the time it's used for aggression. Okay. All right, we'll talk about that in just a second. Hebrews 4 and verse 12. For the word of God is living and active and sharper than the two edged swords and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Yes, exactly right. It mentions it there and in our text, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So again, it, as Mike's helped us to see, all these things are tied to the Word of God. We cannot overemphasize the importance of knowing it, living by it. This is how we're going to be armored. Many times, though, in the Word, we suffer with conflict. Conflict between doing this good thing and this good thing. And supplication, intense prayer. You know, if you, if you go to God in prayer, and, and we'll, we'll get to the prayer in just a minute. Let's hang on to the armor. Okay. That sword of the Spirit, to what Joe was saying. What's its intent? What's its purpose? Okay. These other things generally deal with defensive protection. You know, not being pushed off of your stand in the truth. Yeah, that's where most of these have been. The sword, however, in what he has listed here, is the one offensive weapon. We are at war. What is the purpose and the point of war? To defeat your enemy and to conquer. Anything else? If we if we go back to a physical war, why, why do men fight wars? Sometimes it's to stop evil. Okay, it can be to stop evil. It's to gain territory and to impose the your nation views on the nation. Okay. Very often, gaining territory, gaining control, right? gaining resources. All right? We're at war with the devil, and our job is not just to defend what we have. Our job is to take more territory, take more away from his kingdom and add it to the kingdom of God. The only way that's done is through the sword of the Spirit. When we take that Word of God and we go out there and we use it to prick men's hearts that they would come to a conviction of truth. In that sense, we conquer the enemy by bringing them to the Lord. And instead of them being prisoners and subjugated to us, they become subjugated to the Lord and find true freedom. Mike? And there was a lot about uh, just like the Roman technology at that time, like their shield technology, where they actually locked together. 
so they could move as one unit and gain ground. And they were just impenetrable because of that. They, you know, just their shield technology alone really pushed the Romans to the world power that they were. But, you know, whenever they had practiced together, and they knew those swords are coming out from those shields at the exact same time, and, you know, they were, they were very much in, in step with one another. And, you know, it, to me, you know, whenever he's talking to the Ephesian church about these things, he's also talking about, um, you know, you guys have to be at peace with one another, you have to reconcile with one another, you have to be a unit that works together. Exactly, exactly right, working together. Now, Paul, let's jump on to that prayer. Talk to us about the, the prayer aspect of all of this as he rounds out that list. Prayer and supplication, if you, if you are in conflict and you, you, have, you have a great need, but you know, lots of times you know, you're looking for God for an answer. Sometimes if we spend a little time in prayer and give God a little time, well, we'll get it there. Prayer to strengthen that shield of faith, to harden that helmet of salvation. So we face that conflict. Prayer to know how to use that sword of the Spirit in the right way to help others to obey the gospel. So that prayer is needed as we put on that armor. Um, and we have to put it on with humility, of course. We understand that ultimately we're dependent on God. We, we put on the armor, but we depend on God to go out and to fight this battle, to fight in the war. Now, um, question six, I want to jump to question six. For what does Paul tell the Ephesians to pray? And how does this apply to us? For all the saints and the saints of Paul. Okay, pray for all the saints we're all in this battle together and pray for Paul for what? To what end? Do what? So he'll be bold. Wait, this is the apostle that stood in front of the Jews in Jerusalem and declared the truth to them. He stood before Felix, he stood before Festus, but he's getting ready to stand before Nero. And he's saying, I need boldness to go as I ought to speak. We need boldness to speak the truth. Look, the gospel is going to be offensive to people. It will offend people and anger them. We should not allow that to intimidate us. We should be bold, not arrogant, but bold in the truth. This is the truth. And I am not ashamed of it. I'm not going to apologize for it. This is what the Word of God says. We need that boldness in our lives, no matter how people may react. So, hey, we're out of time, but I'm just going to leave this one thing with you. Pray for the TV program, for my work on that TV program for all men who would stand and teach in the pulpit or in a class here, that we will be bold. That we'll speak as we ought to speak. That we will use the armor of God, the Word of God, effectively to reach people with the truth. We need that. And we need to stand together united in that. Be praying for one another. Pray for the young people as they go out into the world, as they face their peers who have a different set of values and morals. Pray for their boldness that they will be strong and stand fast. All right, we're out of time. Thank you all.